ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره indeed all praise is due to allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek his forgiveness ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا and we seek refuge in allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds may yahdihi allah fala mudilla lah whoever allah has guided none can misguide ومن يضلل فلا هادي له and whoever allah has allowed to go astray none can guide wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah and i bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but allah who is without any partner wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh and i bear witness that muhammad was the last messenger and slave of allah dear viewers we continue with the second part of the program the empire of deceit and in this program we began to look at a story a true story a story which is recorded in the books of revelation and preserved accurately with details in the final book of revelation the quran it is the story of a jinn one from the other creation of allah which has a free will like human beings an invisible being normally invisible to human beings a race known as the jinn one among them by the name of iblis heads an empire an evil empire which was set up many many years ago the beginning when human beings were first created that empire began an empire built on disobedience to god by iblis and his followers an empire built on his arrogance and his pride and his refusal to submit to allah by bowing in recognition bowing before adam in recognition of his superiority that allah had created him on a level above that of his other creatures so he warned in an oath after being cursed by allah after requesting a stay of time he then raged saying i will certainly mislead them human beings and give them false hopes and i will instruct them to slit the ears of cattle and to change allah's creation he swore that he would mislead human beings and give them false hopes about this world and the world to come and he would instruct them to change Allah's creation slitting the ears of cattle tattooing themselves spacing their teeth liposuction surgery to beautify themselves looking like other than who they are etc etc we call it plastic surgery but it is today in most cases being used to change allah's creation so this challenge which satan threw down ultimately aimed at drawing people into disbelief and idolatry in the previous episode we spoke about how his plan was implemented how he drew the descendants of adam in the time of prophet noah into worshiping images statues which is why prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had said the people receiving the most severe punishments on the day of judgment would be the image makers those who carve statues who 
who paint them and draw them, that they would receive the most severe punishment on the Day of Judgment. Because these images form the basis for idolatry. We can see it in Christianity, where the original followers of Christ worshipped one God. They ended up worshipping three gods in one. Then they ended up worshipping Jesus' mother, Mary. Mary Gate was given the label, Mother of God. And images of her and individuals designated as saints, etc., became the order for worship. People would worship them instead of worshiping God. However, even more so, Satan has drawn many others who may not subscribe to that openly, has drawn them into a variety of different sins. Sins which they may consider insignificant, but which ultimately become significant. And that is why Prophet Muhammad had said, Beware of the scorned sins. Iyakum wa muhakkarat al-zunub. Beware of the scorned sins. Because these scorned sins are like people who gather to make a bonfire in a valley. And they go looking over the valley for little sticks and twigs. And when they bring them all together, they make that bonfire and they cook their bread and food, etc. One twig, one stick wouldn't make the bonfire. But when you gather all of those little insignificant twigs and sticks together, you have a blazing bonfire. And the scorn sins are just like that. Very small, very insignificant. It's only a, or it's only, it's not that important. It's minor. We have all kinds of names for it. But in the end, those insignificant sins, when they gather on us, they become like major sins. And they draw us ultimately into the fire. The other way by which Satan comes at the believers is he gets them to commit bid'ah. If he's not successful in the area of the sins, then he gets them to innovate in the religion. To innovate something and call it a good innovation, for example. Bid'ah hasana. Bid'ah, innovation in religion, is something which is opposed, tooth and nail, by the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and all the early generations. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had said, Man ahdatha fi amrina ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Whoever brings anything new, into this religion of ours, it is rejected by God. God does not accept it. It is not acceptable. No matter how nice, good, reasonable, pleasing, pious it might seem. So somebody says, the Christians celebrate the birthday of Christ on the 25th of December. Muhammad وسلم, he's greater than Christ. He's the last of the prophets. So shouldn't we celebrate his birthday also? Well, that sounds reasonable. Might sound logical. But it's bid'ah. It's innovation. It's a change in the religion. Muhammad وسلم, didn't celebrate his birthday. Nor did his companions celebrate it. Nor did he tell people to do it. So it is an innovation in the religion. It is not a part of the religion. So no matter how sincere you might be, or feel you are, in celebrating the birthday of the Prophet, it is something which is cursed. It is not pleasing to God. That is the bottom line. And that is how Christianity became what it was. Innovation. Paul was there actively changing, innovating in the religion. Jesus taught that the followers should obey the laws of God, the commandments, hold on firmly to them. But Paul was saying, no, once we accept Jesus as having died for our sins, the commandments, the law, has no value. It has no real meaning. And so, he innovated. With that thought, we'll take a break and come back and look at the effects of innovation on religion. <laughs> 
Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam Rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. And we talked about how innovation changed the face of Christianity from monotheism into polytheism. It was monotheistic. What Jesus taught was monotheism, worshiping one God alone. As when he was asked, what is the first of the commandments? He repeated what Moses taught, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. He is the only one to be worshipped. He is the only one to be served. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. That was the teaching of Jesus. But others came, led by Paul, and changed these teachings. All of the laws which Jesus swore to uphold, and who said, none of you will enter paradise unless you uphold the law. He required that. This is part of the submission to God. But Paul came along, he said, it is not what goes into your mouth which defiles you, but what comes out. Meaning what? That sounds reasonable. Not what goes into your mouth defiles you, but what comes out. What comes out of your mouth, the things that you say. This defiles a human being. That's true. But the commandments say you shouldn't eat pork. But based on what Paul was saying, it's okay. What goes in your mouth doesn't defile you. It means there's nothing wrong with pork. Though it's not the issue of defilement or non-defilement, the bottom line is that God forbade the eating of pork. So it is about obedience to the laws of God. Not about, has this defiled me or not. The harm of pork, God alone knows best. We're not at liberty to define where the harm lies exactly. Some of the harm is obvious. Some of the harm not so obvious. So the bottom line is we obey God. Paul said, you don't need to. Circumcision. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. And if you stop and think about that for a minute, how could God be circumcised on the eighth day? For those of the viewers who think that Jesus was God. Circumcision of God is nonsensical. So back to the fact of Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day according to the law of Moses, coming from the law of Abraham. Circumcision. What did Paul say? Paul said circumcision is circumcision of the heart. Meaning, you don't need to get circumcised anymore. He was in the process of changing the law, step by step. So whatever was impermissible according to the law, he made permissible. Claiming that once one accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior, God becoming man and sacrificing himself to alleviate or remove from human beings their sins, then after that, works were of no value. No big deal. Salvation lied in accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That is the claim of Paul. But that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus called the people to repent from their sins. And if he was dying for their salvation, what do they need to repent from? And he called the people to worship God. Paul called them to worship Jesus. So with the innovations of Paul changing the law, step by step, people were eventually deviated into worshiping Jesus instead of worshiping the God of Jesus. In any case, as I said, innovation in religion is cursed. Prophet Muhammad had said, Kullu bid'atin dolala. Every innovation in religion is misguidance. Even if you can't see how it is, it seems to produce a good result. It seems to be reasonable and practical. However, reality is, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu bid'atin dolala. Every innovation in religion is misguidance. Sufyan al-Thawri, who was a contemporary of Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, leading scholar of the past, he said, Bid'ah is dearer to Satan than sin. Because one may repent from sin, but not from Bid'ah. Bid'ah is dearer to Satan than sin. Satan, drawing people into innovation, serves his purposes and his goals 
much more so than sin. Sin is better than nothing, draw them into sin, the displeasure of God. But the impact of bid'ah is far greater. The harm, the evil of bid'ah is far greater. So calling one into sin, one may do the sin, but repentance from the sin is much easier. When a person commits a bid'ah, when they establish a bid'ah, they do so deliberately, thinking it out, choosing to do it for one reason or another, usually for the benefit it gets for them, it's their own fulfilling their own desires. This is the norm. Getting back from that, repenting from that, giving that up is much more difficult. And anyone can see that as a norm, even in the field of dawah, when you're trying to invite Muslims to stop committing sins. A Muslim's committing a sin, you ask him, please, don't do this, it's not good, so on, so on, so It's easier for them to give that up than to give up a custom of bid'ah. With the custom of bid'ah has tradition. Our foreparents did it. Our great, great, great grandfathers did it. Were they all wrong? You know, very difficult to give it up. This is what we find people having great difficulty in going against the tradition, the customs, etc. The third major way among the short-term goals of Satan to misguide people is to prevent them from obeying Allah. Where Allah has commanded them to do certain things, He tries to intervene and to prevent them. Prophet Muhammad had given an example of that. When he said, Satan lies in wait on the path of Adam's children. And he lies in wait on the path of Islam. Adam's children being the descendants of Adam. He lies in the, way, the path of Islam, meaning that when people realize that Islam is the truth and they go for it, he's there. And he says to them, will you become Muslims and forsake your religion and that of your forefathers? That is the trap. That trap caught Abu Talib. Abu Talib, the uncle of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, who raised him after his father, his mother, and his grandfather who looked after him, when they died, Abu Talib was the one, his uncle, who looked after him. So, Abu Talib knew Muhammad وسلم, was a messenger of Allah. He saw all the signs. He raised him in his household. He knew him to be a truthful man, just, honest, etc., etc. He knew all of this. And on his deathbed, when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, called him to accept Islam and save himself, his brothers were around him saying, are you going to give up the religion of your forefathers? Are you going to disgrace them? Are you going to embarrass us? And all this. And Abu Talib succumbed. He fell into the trap. And he didn't accept Islam. And what did Prophet Muhammad وسلم, say about him? This man who had done so much to protect the Prophet Wasallam. What did he say about him? He said that he would receive the lightest punishment of those in the hellfire. And what was that? He said he would be given a pair of shoes or sandals from the hellfire. But these sandals, though only up to his ankles, they would be so intense in heat that it would cause his brains to boil and he would think that he is receiving the most severe punishment of anyone in the hellfire that's the consequence satan lies in wait of people who want to accept islam and he whispers to them this are you going to give up the religion of your forefathers this is something we experience. Those of us that are involved in the field of da'wah, when people from certain backgrounds want to become Muslims, they're right on the edge, then they start to worry about family. 
What is my family going to say? How are they going to react? You know, Satan is throwing all these ideas in their heads, discouraging them, dissuading them from making that choice and accepting Islam. So he stays in their way. Prophet ﷺ said, then the person disobeys Satan and becomes a Muslim. So what does he do? Does Satan say, okay, I've lost? No. Then he lies in wait on the path of Hijra, saying, will you migrate and leave your land and sky? Hijra, meaning leaving the environment of disbelief and uh, idolatry, etc. And going into an environment of faith and belief. It may involve leaving your land and going to another land, your town and going to another town or whatever. Difficult to do that because of ties, etc. Very difficult. So Satan stays in his way, discourages him from making that hijra, that migration. But then he disobeys him for the sake of Allah and migrates. Does Satan leave him now and say, okay, he's lost. I can't get him anymore. No. Then he lies in wait of him on the path of jihad and says, will you engage in jihad and strive with yourself and your wealth and fight and be killed so your wife will remarry and your wealth be shared out, distributed? Listen to that. Discouraging him on the basis that if he dies, what's going to happen? His wife is going to marry somebody else. And the wealth he leaves behind, people are going to take it and distribute it amongst themselves. Enjoy. Better not to go out and fight, strive, sacrifice in the path of Allah. Then, Prophet ﷺ said, the righteous believer disobeys Satan and engages in jihad. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does that will deserve to be admitted to paradise by Allah. And whoever is killed will deserve to be admitted to paradise by Allah. So that ploy of Satan is undermined and the believer succeeds. But this is just an example of how Satan will come at the person consistently. will not give up. He'll stay with him until his last breath. And in the coming episode, we will look at some other ploys of Satan. Satan and his party, his group, his armies, how they try to deviate, deceive, and draw people into idolatry and misguidance, sin, corruption, until they join them in hell. With that, dear viewers, I'd like to thank you for being with us in this episode and we hope to see you in the coming episode of the empire of deceit assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh